Welcome to First Baptist Church of Oviedo. As Pam and I finish our sabbatical leave, I have the privilege of introducing the newest member of our ministerial staff, Charlie McDonough. Charlie will be concluding our series of messages on the story. And today's topic is Go and Tell Evangelism. Now, thus far, we've discovered we can become part of someone else's salvation story by inviting them to church or serving their needs. But what about actually sharing the gospel? Let's welcome Charlie as he opens up God's word to us. Good morning. morning. Okay, I was in the 930 service and they did a little better than that. So, I mean, there's a lot more people here right now. So let's, let's try that one more time. You ready? Okay. Good morning. morning. All right, that was a little better. Okay. Hey, uh, as Dan, is it Dan? I'm really new. Forgive me. Um, As he mentioned, I am the newest guy on staff here, and I just want to say a quick thanks to Pastor Mercer, um, or the video of Pastor Mercer, I guess, uh, for the opportunity to preach with you all this morning, to be here, for the opportunity to be on staff at First Baptist Oviedo. I'm excited. I'm pumped up. I hope you guys are too about what God is doing here in Central Florida through this church and in your lives. It is an incredible testimony of what God has done, what God is doing, and I believe what God will continue to do. And I feel honored and privileged to be a part of it, especially to be standing on this stage talking with you this morning. Now, I, I just came in last week. I got here Sunday afternoon. Uh, we had lunch with uh, Greg and some other folks and then went straight over to Mission Interact, which has been an incredible experience. Do we have any Mission Interact people here this week? (laughs) Yeah. Had a little over, uh, right around 200 um, middle schoolers and high schoolers engaged this week in doing local missions, local community stuff around town. There was a sports camp going on somewhere, and, and, and there was other stuff going on other places. I'm not really sure where any of them were. I went to some of them. Uh, I sorted soap. I don't know if you, if, yeah, it's as gross as it sounds. But, uh, but we did it all in Jesus' name, and we had a great time. And I know that we have uh, some great, great stories that I hope you will be hearing in the very near future, what God did that week. Now, uh, let me just give you, since, since you don't know me and I don't know many of you, you know, I'm originally from Central Florida. I actually grew up in Daytona Beach. I, I, I came up at First Baptist Church, Daytona. And, uh, and there was where I kind of came, came into my own and, and learned what it was to be a follower of Christ. And, and actually, that is the church that I was called out of to go into ministry. So if you're familiar with that ministry, you know that um, you know First Baptist in Daytona is known for its commitment to go tell evangelism. Uh, as a matter of fact, back in the day, that took on a lot of forms, but, but one that really took on was something called faith. And if you're, if you're not familiar with that, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but it was this really cheesy way, uh, I don't want to offend anybody, but it was this really, really kind of cheesy way, I felt cheesy every time I did it, of sharing your faith with somebody, and every time you'd have to hold up your hand. Here, do it with me. Go ahead and hold up your hand, hold up all five fingers, spread them out, and, and you're just going to count on your fingers, go F-A-I-T-H. And what we did is we would go out every week, well, once a week, twice a week, sometimes three times a week, depending on the season of life. We would go out and we would go door to door and we would knock on people's doors. Sometimes it was people that we had met and that had visited the church. Sometimes it were people we'd never seen before. And we would go door to door and we would strike up a conversation and we'd begin talking. As we began talking, we would find a way to, to, to turn the conversation until eventually we could stand up and we could say, I want to tell you what God's done in my life and I will tell you by, by this little thing, F-A-I-T-H, and we would go on with a little gospel presentation. And what happened in my life as a young man was I would come to church every week and my pastor, Brother Bobby, would, would get up from the pulpit and he would tell a story. And every week it was, it was the same story, but it was a little different. And it would, it would go a little something like this. He, he would get up and he would tell you that, well, well this week, church, I was, I was in Timbuktu. And I was preaching a revival to a bunch of indigenous creatures there, and, and, and we had about 700 people get saved. And on the way home, I climbed, onto a, I climbed onto a plane. And as we got on the plane, I sat down next to a young man who was, who was sitting there, and he had a book open, and he was reading, and it was obviously he didn't want to be disturbed. But, but as we sat down, the plane began to take off. I began to strike up a conversation with this young man, and, and his name was Fred. And so I would talk to Fred for a little while, and, and it was pretty obvious that Fred wasn't very interested in the gospel, but I just kept talking. And as I kept talking, all of a sudden, the, the, the door by the cabin where the pilot sits and the co-pilot sits, all of a sudden, we started to hear some strange noises up there. And as we heard strange noises, the door flung open and out ran the pilot and the co-pilot with their hair on fire. 
And as their hair was on fire, they went running around and they found a parachute somewhere up front and the door opened up and as the wind was sucking everybody out of the plane, but Fred and I, because we still had our seatbelts on, the pilot and the co-pilot jumped out. And as they jumped out, we could see out the window their little parachutes coming up. And I looked at Fred and I said, "Uh uh-oh. And as the plane began to careen out of control and we could see the land getting closer and closer and closer, I began to ask Fred, would you like to pray with me? And so we began praying, and I held Fred's hand, and Fred held mine, and we began praying, and as the plane crashed, and and, and we could see pieces of debris flying here and flying there, we could see as as the dust settled and everything calmed down that Fred and I were the only two left in the plane. Amongst all the wreckage, it was just he and I. And so I looked at Fred, and I said, Fred, I'd like to share with you F-A-I-T-H. And you know what, church? Fred prayed to receive Jesus. And so growing up, okay, he never actually told that story. But he told stories a lot like that. But growing up, every week, I would hear stories about how my pastor would be out in the streets and out in hotels and out in the world and out in the community and anywhere he could go. And every week, I would hear another story of how he had found the way, found an opportunity, made a way to share Jesus with somebody in his community. And let me tell you what it did in my life. It challenged me, and it stretched me, and it grew me, and it pushed me outside of this shy little kid's comfort zone to where I, went, I began in time going out door to door and knocking on complete strangers' doors and trying to find a way to tell them about Jesus. And it made such an impact. I don't know about in everybody else's life. Because I I could share with you stories of people that I had the opportunity to lead to Jesus. I could tell you stories about teams that I went out with where we saw many people get saved or a few people get saved. I I can tell you all kinds of stories about lives that invested in me and lives that I had the privilege of investing in because we took the time and we made an opportunity to find a way to go and tell somebody what God had done in our lives. I can't tell you what it did in them, but I can tell you what it did in me. It changed me slowly over time. It wasn't an an immediate thing, but it changed me from the inside out. It created in me, it birthed in me this passion for people, this desire to see God do in others what I know he had done in my life. And so this morning, what we've done is we've actually chartered some buses, and in just a few minutes, we're going to release early, and we're all going to go out, and we're going to get in buses, and we're going to go all over Orlando and go door to door, and you guys look nervous. Okay, not really, not really. I've only been here a week. I couldn't line all that up. <clears throat> but you were scared, weren't you? There's this something inside of you, this little thing deep down that was like, is this guy serious? He's new. I don't know if he knows how we do things around here. We don't, this is Orlando. You don't go around and knock on random doors in Orlando. Hello? You know, I mean, but there's something inside of you that was scared because because I know because even though I've done it, I don't know how many times. Even though I've been a part of it, even though I've I've I've, I've created environments where other people can do it, every time, even standing up in front of you, a, a church that, that that I'm learning to love, a church that I'm a part of, uh, even standing in front of you, it's nerve wracking to stand up and speak the story of what God has done in my life. And and I think it really boils down to just a couple of reasons. There's there's a couple of things that I have found in my life, and I think you'll find it to be true in yours yours as well, some things that really scare me anytime I step out, anytime I begin to share, anytime I try to tell my story as I go. And those things are this. There's there's three things that kind of bother me. One, I'm scared I won't know what to say. Anybody else? You ever scared you won't know what to say? Just, Just raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. It's okay. You know, if we could be honest, I think all of us would throw our hand up. We're afraid we won't know what to say. You know, not all of us have seminary degrees. Some of us who do have seminary degrees really just skid by by the skin of our teeth. You know, nobody asked to see my transcripts. You know, not all of us. What? (laughs) Search committee is like, oh, no. (laughs) What did we do? Deacon's worst nightmare, youth pastor on the stage. Listen. Not all of us have all the right answers. What, what What if they ask me if Adam and Eve had a belly button? I don't know, I don't, I don't know. Did they? Did they, did they or didn't they? I, I, I can't answer. What if they ask me how old the earth is? I'm going to say like 5,000 years, they're going to be like, 
idiot? And, and, and uh, what, if, what if they tell me, what if they come up with some strange, what if they go into eschatology or ecclesiology or some other ology that I don't even know what it means? And, and what, what, I'm not going to have all the answers. I'm not going to know what to say. And, and, and so, so we kind of shrink back and we don't tell our story because we're afraid we won't have all the answers. The, the other thing that, 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 that frightens us, or at least it frightens me, is that uh, we're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. Uh, okay, maybe, the, maybe not we. I'm afraid that I'm going to say the wrong thing. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's scary because it's not, you, there's no neutral there's no neutrality. There's, there's no not being emotional about this kind of thing because this is your story you're telling. This is your story of what God's done in your life. This, this is something very, very personal and very unique to you. But it, you're telling it because you care about somebody, right? You're telling it because you care about somebody so much that you're willing to embarrass yourself or potentially embarrass yourself. So you kind of step out there and you begin talking and you begin sharing. And then you realize, wait, I might say something wrong. And if I say something wrong, then they're not going to believe, and if they don't believe, and then, then the whole thing's going to fall apart, and if the whole thing falls apart, then, 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 then everything's going to be ruined, and then they're never going to believe, and they're never going to know, and then everything's going to be messed up, and it's all going to be my fault. <sighs> so we shrink back, and we don't talk. We shrink back, and we don't tell, because we, we don't really know what to say. And we're so afraid to say the wrong thing. And then really the biggest one for me, the, the, the biggest one, the, the elephant in the room that most of us, most of the time, we don't talk about. The, the biggest one is that, that number three, if you're keeping notes. We're afraid that they're going to reject us. You know, the reason that we care enough about somebody to take the time to share the gospel, the reason we care enough about somebody to want to go and tell, the reason that we care enough is because they're important to us. The reason that it matters is because they matter. The reason we want to tell is because we want them to know. The reason that it matters to me is because they matter to me. And so sometimes the relationship gets so big, sometimes the love gets so big, sometimes the person becomes so important that we lose sight of the simple fact that if we love them, we have to say something. Because if we don't, we're doing the furthest thing from loving them. But sometimes the simple fact that I'm afraid that I might lose a friend, or I'm afraid that a coworker is gonna look at me weird every time I walk by, especially in the office I work in. Just throwing that out there. Or I'm afraid that, you know, my neighbor, it's gonna be weird. Or I'm afraid it just may break the relationship entirely and they may never speak to me again. Really, if I'm being really honest, yeah, I'm scared that I might not know what to say. Yeah, I'm worried that I might say something wrong. But if I'm really being honest, the big thing that scares me most of the time, I'm scared they're not going to like me anymore. I'm scared they're not going to believe me. But I'm really afraid that, you know, if I, if I go there, there's no going back. You know, the weird thing is we, we, don't, we don't think that way when we think about football, do we? How many Florida State fans do we have in the house? Woo! <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to mention any other schools because they don't matter. But we don't think... <laughs> We don't think that way. We don't think that way about college football. We don't think that way about college basketball. We don't think that way about cheerleading. Oh, wait, that's not really a sport. We don't think that way. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't think that way about oh, anything else in life. We, we don't really think that way about politics. We don't really think that way about anything. But when we come into this narrow sliver, when we come into this one little conversation, when we come into the most important truth in your life, all of a sudden this fear wells up inside us that becomes so unbearable that we shrink back and we go because we go to the store. We go to work. We go to our friend's house. We go out to school. We go and we do and we do and we go. But we never ever, ever tell the going we've got down pat, but we are so afraid while we go, we don't tell. That's a man who needs to tell somebody about Jesus. 
Or maybe be told about Jesus. I don't know. But I want you to take heart, church. I want you to take heart. We're going to be looking at the Gospel of John, chapter 1. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open it up with me. I would like for you to turn there. And we are going to look at these simple truths, these simple things that are not just a modern phenomenon. They're not just a problem in my life. I don't believe they're just a problem in our lives. They were a problem in first century life. They were a problem for the very people who walked face to face, arm in arm, shoulder to shoulder with Jesus. This is not a new problem. This is not a new thing. These issues, these fears have been around, I believe, as long as the gospel has been around. So if you've got your Bibles, open up with me to the first chapter of the Gospel of John. We're going to start in verse 43. I'm a professional. Verse 43. Join with me as we read. Verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave Galilee, and finding Philip, he said, follow me. Now, if you're a student of the Bible, you know that that is probably not all there was to the story. If you look a few verses back, you don't have to look there now. You can look later this afternoon, right before you take your nap. When when you look a few verses back, you'll see the same scene was played out with John, and the same scene was played out with Peter. And and what really happened, the, the big picture of that story, you see in some of the other Gospels where Jesus walked up and began to teach. And as he was teaching, he pushed out into the lake in Peter's boat. And then they got out there in the middle of the day. Peter had already like washed up all his nets and cleaned them up and put them away on the boat and Jesus said let out for a catch and and after a little a little pushback Peter let out for a catch and he pulled in so much such a large catch that he had to call his partner's boats out to to, before they would sink before all the fish would weigh them down and sink them and so so after that after they get back on shore Jesus pronounces to Peter from if you follow me come follow me and from now on you will fish men, and Peter drops everything and follows him. So it's a fair assumption that probably there's a little more to the story that we don't know about that's not recorded in scripture. Jesus comes to Philip and says, Philip, I want you to follow me. And whatever the circumstance was, whatever, the, whatever happened, whatever it is that, that there was an experience there, this experience with Jesus drew, pe- drew Philip out of his everyday life into a fellowship of Christ. Now, that experience didn't just draw Philip to follow Jesus. It did the same thing in Philip's life that Jesus promised it would do in Peter's life. He said, come follow me to Peter, and I will make you fishers of men. If you will follow me, you will catch men. It's a conditional statement. There's no, if you do this and this and this and this, then maybe this and this and this. It's, if you follow, you will fish. And he calls Peter. Come, or Philip, come, follow me. So, Philip followed him. Now, verse 44, Philip, like Andrew and Peter, remember, were from the same town of Bethsaida. Philip found, Philip goes out and finds Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and and about who the prophets also wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. All right, so here's what happens in Philip's life. Philip comes to a point in his life where he has an experience with Jesus. He has a face-to-face moment with the living God, and that causes a change in his life. Now, apparently, the very first thing Philip thinks about in this moment is, I have a friend. I know somebody. And I want this guy to experience what I have experienced. Now, We get excited about stuff, don't we? Evidently, somebody gets excited about Gator football. We get excited about movies. I get excited about any new Batman movie. If there's a movie with Batman movie, Batman in it, I get excited. Uh, if there's a movie, how many of y'all like the new Superman movie? It was, it was pretty crazy. A bunch of people recommended it. Lord of the Rings, there's those people. Just leave them alone, but they're, they're awesome and they're out there and they get really excited about Lord of the Rings. And then, they, you know, we get excited about sports teams. We get excited about movies. We get excited about going to the mall. Ladies, well, maybe not the Oviedo Mall, but we get excited about going... We get excited about all kinds of things. And when we get excited, what do we do? We can't keep our mouths shut. We go and we tell everybody. We tell everybody the thing that we're excited about. When you get a new car, the first thing you do is you drive it into, you drive it into school, or you drive it into work, you drive it into church. You're like, hey, I got a new car. Come see. I remember sitting with, 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 with a friend of mine, a former student. She's 16 years old, got her very first car. She drove up, drove up to the church on a Thursday afternoon. Who goes to church on Thursday afternoon? Drives up to the church on Thursday afternoon so I could sit and smell the new car smell. 
We get excited about things that happen in our life. And that is exactly what happens to Philip. That's exactly what happens to you. It's exactly what happens to me. When Jesus steps in and we have an encounter, we have an experience, we have a face-to-face moment with the living God, we should get excited. God, help us if we leave church like, well, that was nice. We should be excited about the fact that there is a God who knows our name, who wants us to follow, who loves us just the way we are, even with all of our junk. And that's what happened to Philip. He was so excited he couldn't keep his mouth shut. So he takes the initiative to go find his friend, Nathaniel. He goes. Look what it says next. Philip found Nathanael and told him. Talk about not knowing what to say. Talk talk about not knowing how to put it. Talk about not having the correct theological construct. Talk about not having all your doctrine straight. Talk about not, you know, I don't really have a good instrument. I mean, he runs up to his friend. He's like, we found him. We found him. We found him. Who'd you find? Him. You know, the guy. We found the guy. We we found him. Who's him? You know, the, the... the, the one Moses talked about, you know, the guy, the one, all the prophets. I don't even, what was it, M- 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 Messiah? M- yeah, he can't even get the word out. We didn't find the chosen one. We didn't find Emmanuel. We didn't find the Messiah. We found the guy. We found him, the guy that Moses talked about, the guy all the prophets talked about. We found him. Philip didn't know what to say. All he knew was, hey, this guy, has, he's the one, and you're not going to, you got to come, you, you got to know, you got to understand, I found the guy. And he, he goes on, he goes on, we, we, where are we, verse 45, Philip, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus, uh-oh, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of of Joseph. So, so you got to understand the hype here, all right? Because because he, maybe he didn't get the right words out. Maybe he didn't know how to put it. Maybe he didn't know how to phrase it. But when he started talking about Moses and prophets, Nathaniel puts it together and said, oh, he's talking about the Messiah. He's talking about the chosen one. He's talking about the one who's going to come and liberate all of us. He's talking about that guy. All right, so build up this big expectation, this huge thing, and then Philip says the wrong thing. He doesn't know what to say, and then he manages to say the wrong thing. Jesus of Nazareth. Okay. I'm trying to figure out how to, how to put this here. Let, let's say that I were to run up to my brother over here, <clears throat> and I were to say, dude, dude, you're not going to, what's your name? Terry, 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 you're not going to believe it. I just met Team Tebow. I, I was walking down the road, and there was Tim Tebow. I just met the guy, you know, the guy, you know, you know, Tim Tebow, the guy. I just met the guy. Really, where was he? Oh, he was walking down on OBT. <laughs> no, 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 no. He was over in Aster. He was over right by the bull peanut stand. And the, you know, the flashing yellow light and the bull peanut stand. That's where he was. He was over there just chilling out. Just hanging out with some guys, you know, he was over there. <laughs> Listen, if you, could, if you could find the bright center of the universe, Nazareth is the place that's farthest from it. All right? They're, 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 it's, it's, it's way out there. It's in the middle of nowhere. Nothing good comes from Nazareth. And, and, and I can imagine as Philip says these words, as he begins to speak, he says, He's Jesus, the guy from Nazareth. The son of Joseph. Some guy you've never heard of. And listen to Nathaniel's response because it's exactly what you and I are afraid our response, the response would be to us if we were to share. In verse 46, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. Uh oh. See, all the excitement, all, all, of the, all of the joy, all of the, oh my gosh, I've got to share, oh, I've got to go tell. All of, the, all of the stuff that drove Philip to go out there is now just crumbling beneath his feet. All of, all of the stuff that, that, that drew him out, that pushed him out, all the stuff that made him so he couldn't keep his mouth shut is all just crumbling beneath him. His friend is, is on the verge of rejecting him. His friend is on the verge of saying, look, you're, you're a complete idiot. How can you think anything like this is, is you know, all of this stuff, it's just 
completely messed up. It's completely turned around and he doesn't know what to do. He didn't know what to say. He said the wrong thing. And it's not working out the way that he thought it would. But Nathaniel says something. Nathaniel does something that you and I can learn from. Nathaniel doesn't give up. Nathaniel does, or Philip doesn't give up. Philip doesn't shrink back. Philip doesn't decide, oh, wait, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. You know, we're just going to go back to talking about the weather. Philip steps out and says this. Verse 46b, come and see, says Philip. Come and see. So wait a minute, Pastor Charlie guy. This is your first week, we know, but, but, but you know, Nathan did that a couple weeks ago. We had the serve, seek and serve. We had the come and see. You're supposed to be the go and tell guy. Well, let me tell you the simple truth. The fact of the matter is, you and I are not called to be theologians. You and I are not called to have all the answers. You and I are not called to know every answer to every question and to make everything go away and every argument void. You and I are called to go and tell what it is that God has done in our life. You and I are called to be a witness of what Jesus has done in you to the world around you. And when, the, when Philip came to a point where all of his arguments and all of his telling and all of his information failed to be enough, he did the one thing he knew how to do. I want to bring you some way, somehow, someplace where you can have the same experience with Jesus that I had. I want you to know what I know. So if that means come and see, Come and see. The simple truth is, the fact of the matter is, if you are rejected, they are not rejecting you. They are rejecting him. If we don't close the deal, that's not our responsibility. We were never called to make converts. We were never called to make decisions. We were never called to go out and build an army. We were called to be faithful to go. And while we go, be faithful to tell. So Philip says to his friend, come and see. <clears throat> Skip down to verse 49. Philip takes Nathaniel, his friend, to Jesus. And we get a little more detail about what that interaction is like. And Jesus begins to tell him stuff that nobody else would know. Jesus began to prove to him by what he does and who he is and the way he responds. Just the way he proved to you by who he is and what he does and the way he responds. That he is the Messiah, the Son of God. And Nathanael's response is simply this. Verse 49, then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Listen, church, you are not responsible for proving who Jesus is. He can do that all by himself. You and I are responsible to be faithful to go and tell and provide the opportunity in the lives of the people we care about, in the lives of the people we work with, in the lives of the people on our team, in our community, in our school, to provide them with the same opportunity that someone provided you, that they may know the love of a God who did everything, who did everything, everything to display his love for them on a cross. You know, I want to share with you a story. Because by the time I got engaged at First Daytona, by the time I, I really stepped out and began doing this, I, I, was, I was married, I, I was in my early 20s, and... and um, I came out of high school and I really, wanted to, I really wanted to be that guy. I had wrestled with what God was calling me to do and, and you know, all these different things and finally settled on, 
um, I was going to go to art school. I was going to I was going to work for Disney, or I was going to be an animator. I was going to do some big crazy art thing. And I, I had people telling me I had talent. I had people telling me I could go all the way. So, so I figured that that was my thing. I wouldn't have talent unless God had given it to me, right? So, so I went and I, and, and I discovered to get into the school I wanted to go to that I needed to have some prerequisites. So I went to a local community school where I met a guy named Steve, and he was in charge of the art program. And Steve, over the course of the year that I went there, um, became a friend. He was an older man. He, he, had, he had served in uh, the Air Force Special Forces, and so, so he walked with a limp. Uh, you would never know it. He, he, was, he was older. He was a little bigger. Uh, he walked with a limp. He had a ponytail about halfway down his back. He was just a crazy big, big old beard. He was this crazy, funky-looking old guy, and, and he was great. Uh, he was a really, really talented artist. He had come out of the service and, 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 and pursued this and, and had, had a great deal of success in it. Now he was, he was teaching and, and because that, that allowed him to do his own thing on the side. And so Steve kind of took me under his wing. And, and so, so he and I would talk, and you know, I spent a lot of late nights there because I had a lot of prerequisites to get out of the way, a lot of stuff I had to do, a lot of portfolio to build. And so, so I spent a lot of late nights and a lot of time and extra hours in the office and doing projects and, and special stuff. And he had all this stuff set up, and I could come in to use it. And he opened up his studio to me. And, 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 and it, was, it was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience for me. And I began over the course of a year to think of this man not just as a teacher but as a friend. And so as time went on, my year finished, I, I, I kind of thought and tried to, you know, work my way around to sharing Jesus with him at some point because it was obvious that he was lost. He wasn't a bad person. He just was somebody who didn't know Jesus. But, you know, I figured I always had more time. It, I, I'd do it later. You know, I, I'd, I'd figure it out. And, and you know, I, finally I was, I was moving up to, to when I was going to ship off to, to Tallahassee to go to the fine arts school there. And, and, and I was in, in, in this one summer of life. I was moving away from home. I was starting a new school. I was going to come back in July and get married. And, and all these crazy things were going on. It was just rush, 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 rush all the time. And I just never found the time. I never made the time to talk to Steve about what God had done in my life. And so finally, in early June, I moved. And I went up for my first six-week semester up at Florida State, and then I came back in, in mid-July when that semester had ended, and I had about two weeks before uh, I was going to get married to Stacy. And I never got Steve's home address, so I decided I'd go by his office and hand deliver the invitation, because it was important to me that he'd be there, and I figured I'd have the opportunity maybe to talk to him, find a way to work ways around. And so I parked on the far end of campus, because I didn't have a pass anymore, and I walked all the way in, and as I walk into his office, I see these guys carrying these large pieces that Steve had done out of the studio. And as I walk in, I see that there's another group in there kind of cleaning up over here and a group in here cleaning up in his office. And, 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 a, and a younger guy that, that looked like a, a, a younger version of Steve kind of in there, kind of directing everybody. And, and I just came up to him and I was like, excuse me, have you seen Steve? I wanted to talk to him. I wanted to give him, well, I'm getting married in a couple of weeks. And I, I thought it would be really cool if he could come. And um, I wanted to give an invitation to him. And when I said that, his, his face kind of fell. He's like, you know, who? Who, who are you? How do you know Steve? And so I, I told him my story and, you know, who I was and where I came from and why I was back. It's like, well, you, you couldn't have heard then. Three nights ago, Steve, from some complications, from an injury he had, from a thing he'd done a long time ago, passed away of a massive heart attack at the age of 50. I'm very sorry. And all of a sudden, in my head and in my heart, all of these moments, all of these late nights, all of these classes, all of these times when I sat in his office, all of these times when I had the opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, time after time after time, when I could have turned the conversation, when I could have made it awkward, when I could have done something weird, when I, when I might have been rejected, when I might have not known the right thing to say, or I might have said the wrong thing, all of them blew through my mind in just a moment. And I realized that I had never taken the time, and now I will never have the chance. Next week, I'll be married for 19 years. And it was about this time 19 years ago that I found out that someone that I counted as a friend, someone who took time out of their life to invest in me, 
never heard the gospel. Because I was scared. Church, I don't know. I don't know if you know what that feels like. I, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. I, I, I pray that you haven't. I pray that you never will. But I can tell you this one thing. I never, ever, ever want to feel that way about anyone else ever again. Because there is something out there waiting on the other side. And it is either a beautiful, wonderful eternity set aside with our Heavenly Father or it's an eternity in separation from Him. And I can tell you for certain, I don't know, but I'm pretty sure where my friend has been for 19 years. Church, I'm not asking you I'm not challenging you. I, I'm, not, I'm not seeking to make you into people who walk around and thump folks in the head with your Bible. I'm not asking you to walk around and tell people the Ten Commandments are not multiple choice. I'm simply asking you that as you go, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm begging you. I'm pleading with you. I'm imploring you. I'm asking you with everything that I have inside me with which I can ask. As you go, whether it's to the ball field or to the mall, whether it's to your work or whether it's to school, whether it's on a team or whether it's in a dance troupe, whether, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, as you go, find a way to tell what it is that God has done in your life. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to say all the right things. All you and I are charged to do is to share what it is God has done in our lives and allow Jesus to be in you what you would love for him to be in the lives of those around you let's pray together Heavenly Father Father, you are good, and you are sovereign, and you are just, and you are holy, and God, there is not a thing going on in the lives of anyone here that takes you by surprise. God, there, there's, not a, there's not a name that is crossed through our minds as we talk about going and telling, as we look at the process of, of, of explaining your gospel and sharing our faith with those around us. God, there's not a name that's cropped through our mind, Father. There's not a face that we thought of. There's not a friend at work or someone we go to school with that you didn't know was coming. You know those that you've already put on our hearts. Father, this morning I pray that the church wouldn't commit. We don't need another commitment, Father. I pray that this morning the church would surrender. Surrender to your will in their lives. This is not something they need to pray about. This is not something they need to be gifted to do. This is something you simply said, as we follow, we will do. So God, I pray that we would surrender to your mission in the world. To reconcile the lost with a loving Savior. With everybody's head down, everybody's eyes closed, we're, this invitation is going to take on two parts this morning. First, I, first I'm going to ask the church. I'm going to ask those of you that are followers of Christ. I'm going to ask this morning that you would surrender to who it is that God has already laid on your heart because I believe that he has. There are people you walk by every day in the grocery store. There are people that you walk by every day in the office. There are people that you see all the time. And, and you, they may be great people. They may be beautiful people. They may be wonderful people. But you don't know if they are connected to God in Christ. I'm going to ask if you are willing to come forward this morning and pray for them by name out loud and commit within yourself, surrender in your heart that God, whatever it takes, I'm going to find a way. I'm going to find a way to tell my story. I'm going to find a way to say the name of Jesus. 
And church, that's what I'm going to ask you to do this morning. But I believe with all my heart that in a church this size, with this many people in the room, for some of us in here, the reason that we never share our story is because we don't have one. Maybe we've been in church for a long time. Maybe we just wandered in off the street today. Maybe a friend invited you. Maybe you just came because it was Sunday and this is your thing. But the reason that you don't tell your story of what God's done in your life is because you've seen what he's done in other people's lives, but there's never been a change in you. And this morning, I want you to know that there is indeed a God in heaven that knows your name. He knows the number of hair on your head, and for some of us, that number's changing pretty quick. But not only that, he knows every good thing you've ever done, and he's completely unimpressed. And he knows every wrong thing. And he loves you still. Scripture says it this way, in this we know what love is. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What that means is that thing that you think about when it's just you alone at home at night, when the lights go out and you're staring at the ceiling and that one regret comes back to your mind, that, that thing that you were, the, what, who you were on your worst day, that is the you that Jesus loves and died for. And Scripture says that if we are faithful to confess our sin, he will be faithful to forgive us. It says if you believe with your heart that Jesus is Lord, confess with your mouth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And so in just a moment, the altar will be open, and I'm going to ask the church to come and pray for those they need to come and pray for. But if this is you this morning, I want to say a prayer with you right now. I want to lead you in a prayer. There's nothing magic about the words. It's your heart confessing out loud to God that you believe in Jesus and that he rose from the dead. If that's you this morning, I want you to pray with me. I want you to pray, Dear Heavenly Father, I know I've done things wrong. Your word calls it sin. And God, I can't, I can't make it right. But because of Jesus, because he is your son, because he was born, because he rose again, because he died for my sin, God, I ask that you would forgive me. God, I ask that you would adopt me. Jesus, I ask that you would come into my life, not just as my Savior, but as my God. And I believe that you will because you promised. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. With everybody's head down, everybody's eyes closed, if you just prayed that prayer tonight, this morning, I'm just going to ask you to look up at me. All right? In just a moment, the band's going to begin to play, and the altar will be open. I'm going to ask those of you who just prayed that to be the first ones down. I'm going to ask you to come to my right. Come over here. We'll have counselors, we have pastors, we have ministers down here who would love to speak with you, who would love to talk you through what it is to have a relationship with the Holy God. You didn't join a church, you didn't join a religion, you didn't join a movement. What you did was begin a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus. Church, I'm going to ask you to come to this side over here. Get alone, get quiet, and pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would move this morning. God, that you would do what it is that only you can do. You would prove yourself holy, righteous, and strong. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure 
that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turned his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon a cross my sin upon his shoulders ashamed i hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life I know that it is Heavenly Father, God, I pray that we would be a church that doesn't limit ourselves to one way of telling people about you. Father, that we would seek and to serve so that we may tell our story. Father, we would create environments where people would want to come and see so that we may share our story. And Father, that we would be faithful to walk outside these doors into a world that is lost and hurting and dying in separation from you. And be faithful as we go to tell our story. Because at the end, that is all we will be left with. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We will overcome by your sacrifice for us and our story with you. So, Father, may we be faithful to go and tell our story.